is our prayer book. Uh, it's prayed over many times every week. We all know that. Uh, pretty much every day of the week. A lot of names are in this book, Seeking Prayer and Direction. And uh, so we have this sticker here. And if you'll send us a good address and uh, a solid address, Pastor Woody will send you this that says, Rock and Country Church is praying for me. And that does happen. I see it every week. Uh, a lot of names are in this book need prayer. If y'all will please remove your hats. Lord, we lift this book up to you today. We pray for all the names in this book. Lord, we'd ask that you'd reach out your hand. Uh, you know their troubles, Lord. You know the healing, the direction. If they need to go, all they have to do is call your name. Lord, we pray for them. We pray for our community. We pray for the, our servicemen abroad. Uh, Lord, we continue to pray for this church. And Pastor Woody, as you bring him the message, Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. I know. I get it. I get it. Hey, good morning, Rockin' Country Church. Everybody feel better about themselves from last week? <laughs> Maybe some do. Maybe some do. Maybe some don't, huh? Right? Well, I hope you do because God loves you. He does, he does, and I hope you know that. I hope you realize that, and I hope you receive that message. And today we're going to go a little bit further into that same type of message, and uh, we'll get to that in just a second. But uh, Miss Terry informs me that we have teenagers here. It's most likely teenagers are not going to want to go back and, and uh, do that, So, and she likes to hear the message. So if it's okay with you guys, unless you want to go back, you guys want to go back to the back and uh, with Miss Terry? I didn't think you would, but anyway. I kind of like being with her. She's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so you guys just, uh, you know, you're welcome to stay in here. And uh, hopefully you'll receive the message as well because it's certainly, I think, easy enough for you guys to understand. And I don't mean that disrespectfully uh, because there's some of us that don't understand my message, okay? And I said some of us. Okay, but we try to make it as plain and as clear as possible, and uh, so well, let's go ahead and pray up our teaching for today, and uh, we will get started, all right? And uh, if you look up here, you're Ezekiel 36. Go ahead and find that book. It is after Jeremiah and Lamentations. It's before Jeremiah, I mean, af yeah, before, after Jeremiah and Lamentations, before Daniel. So go ahead and find that book, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, and mark that. That's not where we're going to start, as you probably know, but mark that so that we can refer back to it, because that is our scripture for the day, all right? So with that, let's go ahead and pray up our teaching, and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for each and every day. Father, we thank you for the breath of life itself. We ask that you open up our hearts, minds, souls, and spirits to receive your word today, so that we may come to the better understanding that you have intended for us through the love of your Son, Jesus Christ who is our Lord and our Savior. And it is by his works and his works alone that we are saved. Certainly nothing that we do. Father, we give you all the praise and all the glory, and we lift up our tithing, our offering to you today, Lord. We ask that you bless those who have given into your kingdom and uh, just pour out their blessings, pressed down, shaken, and poured out in their lap, the, Lord, the blessings that you have in store for them. Father, be with us today to to guide us and direct us in all things for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, thank you for being here today. Um, now, for those of you that are new, you know, of course, uh, you have find out and we'll find out that we give you the scripture for today, but that's not the only scripture we're gonna use. Not by any means. And the reason for that is simply this. Uh, how many just went right to the book of Ezekiel? And don't raise your hand. But I guarantee you there's some of you, Ezekiel, what's that? Where's that at? That's why I gave you, that's why I gave it to you. Because we generally don't know our Bible, okay? A lot of us don't know all we, well, none of us know all we need to know. But I use different scriptures as God gives them to me. And I want you to go to them. So if you don't have a Bible, if you need a Bible, we've got some back there. We'll be happy to give you one, share with you. But I want you to know that what we teach on, what God has given me to teach on, is out of the Word of God. We don't teach out of anything else. We only teach out of the Word of God. And we use several scriptures. Why? Because scripture confirms itself. 
Scripture always confirms itself. Scripture always uh, witness, witnesses to itself. Always. And so over and over and over, we flip through the Bible so that we learn the different scriptures and, and we try to get a full message of what the Lord is, uh, has given us for this day. All right, so we're going to be uh, in Ezekiel 36 and, oh, I don't know, probably about 2 o'clock this afternoon we'll get there. Okay? Is that all right? We're okay with that, right? All right. Well, it won't be that long. I, I was going to say I promise, but I can't promise anything I can't keep, right? We're actually going to start in Ephesians 2. So if you want to open your Bibles, Mark, Ezekiel, but open your Bibles to Ephesians 2. This is kind of what we talked about last week a little bit, and I want to uh, expound on that and then go on into today's teaching. Last week, we discussed being saved through works. And whenever I says, can you be saved through works? Many of you, and I won't point out anybody in particular, Many of you shook your head no, and that is true, because why the church always teaches us that you are not saved by works. You cannot be saved by works, but what the church fails to teach us is you are not saved by your works. You're not saved by your works, but you are saved by works. You are saved by the works of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and all that he did while he walked this earth, and it is only by his works by him being obedient to the Father, that you have the opportunity to, to go to heaven. Jesus said, I came to do the works my Father gave me. So he did works. He did a lot of awesome works. Just three and a half years, he changed the world. And of course, we know he's God, right? But we have to understand that Jesus did do works. Matter of fact, his purpose was to come here to do works. To do works. And we'll see at the end of our message today why we look at his works in order that we should do our works. Okay, we'll see that at the very end. That'll be about four this afternoon. All right? So we're going to be in, in uh, Ephesians 2. Does anybody need a Bible? Everybody got one? Everybody good to go? All right, Ephesians 2, starting at verse 4. Ephesians 2, starting at verse 4. I love this. But God, but God, you see, we look at our lives and we think about all the wondrous things that we've done. Well, according to uh, the scriptures, they, our righteousness is like filthy rags, right? They're like filthy rags, but God. Oh, I've done all this stuff for God and, you know, I didn't quite get it all done the way I thought I should do it, but God. Well, you know, I tried to do this and I failed, but God. See, but God, but God, but God, but God who is rich, rich, that means he's got plenty. He don't have just a little bit to kind of cut up and share with each of us. He's got plenty for all of us who is rich in mercy because of his great love, because of his great love, which he loved us. See, God loves you. God loves you so much, he sent his one and only begotten son to come and die for you. For Jesus to come and do the works. Do the works so that you could get into heaven. So that you would have a way. He paid the way. He paid for the way. So that you could get into heaven. Verse 5. Now look at this because we're going to refer back to verse 5 in just a second. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Remember last week I left out a, 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 little, a little snippet, if you will, in all the scriptures that we use that had it in, and I came back towards the end and I told you, in Christ, in Christ. So see, it's not about you doing anything by yourself. It's about you doing everything in Christ, in Christ. Better yet, Christ in you. Better yet, Christ in you. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Verse 7. Then in the ages to come he might show his exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. See, it always goes back to in Christ. 
in Christ. Now, what does it mean to be in Christ? It means you in Christ and Christ in you. Because if you don't have Christ, you're not getting into heaven, John 14, 6. No one comes to the Father except through him. So we have to understand and we have to believe our salvation does not come from anywhere but Christ. That's it. He goes on to say, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. That not of yourselves. So by yourself, you're nothing. Now, I don't mean to make you feel bad again, but seriously, by yourself, without Christ, you will not get into heaven. You won't. There's not a, well, but I'm so good. Well, you ain't been good enough. I showed you that last week. And guess what? You will never be good enough because you don't compare yourself against me. Now, if you compare yourself against me, especially if you compare yourself against Johnny, you're probably good enough. But if you compare yourself, which we should, to Christ, you fall short of the glory of God, do we not? Yeah, we do. Paul tells us, remember, we, should, we looked at this uh, over in uh, Romans chapter 3. There is no one righteous. No, not one. Not one. Oh, but what about the Pope? He fails. What about uh, Billy Graham? He fails. What about any other famous person, if you will, that is supposedly men of God, and we'll say that they're men of God just to be respectful, they still fail. We all fail. Now, you feeling good about yourself now? Oh, you mean I'm a failure? No, you're not a failure. You will be a failure if you do not receive in Christ because you will fail to get into heaven. But with Christ, in Christ, Christ in you, you will make it to heaven. You will. Verse 8 again, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It is a gift. Now, I got some Christmas gifts this last Christmas, and you know what? I didn't have to pay for any of them. Not a one. I'm paying for it now because there's a lot of good Reese's peanut butter cups. <laughs> but the point is, is that I didn't have to pay for any of my gifts. Why? Because they were a gift. If I had to pay for it, they would no longer be a gift. So you see, you don't pay for your salvation. It is a free gift of God that he gives you. Why? Because Christ has already paid for it. Christ has paid your dead sin to God which allows you, if you are in Christ, to get into the kingdom of heaven. And furthermore, even to see the kingdom of heaven. We're going to look at John 3 in just a second. Not by works. This is where we always make the mistake, preachers, ministers. This is where we always make the mistake. Not by works, least anyone should boast. Now that tells us right off the bat that it's not by any of our works because if it were by our works, then we would say, look at me. I got myself into heaven. That can't happen. It is against God and it cannot happen. It is a free gift of God that God gives you because he loves you, not because you're such a good person. And you are good people except maybe Johnny and me. But we try to be. We're working on it, right, Johnny? We're working on it. You better believe it. But God gives us that free gift because of one reason and one reason alone. It's because we accept all that his son has done for us and we trust in the blood of Jesus to get us into heaven. Because only the blood of Jesus, the sacrificial blood of Jesus is going to allow you. It's going to wash away your sins. Only that is going to allow you to get into heaven. There's nothing else. Nothing. We're not going to do verse 10 yet. We're going to come back to that. So hold that place. Hold that place. I got one line of my notes done. 
<laughs> so you know we'll be here at about four, right? So only by grace, God's love for us is poured out through the sacrificial death by the works of Christ, least anyone should boast. And only by the works of Christ can anyone be saved. Absolutely no one can be saved except through the works of Christ. Let's look back at verse 5 here. Ephesians 2 and 5. It says, even when we were dead in trespasses. Even when we were dead in trespasses. You can't get much worse off than being dead in your sins, can you? Now, we talked about this over in the book of Romans where it says, and the wages of sin is death. So if we have sin, and we know we do, we're dead in our trespasses. We're dead in our sins. What does being dead here in this scripture mean? It doesn't mean the physically de physical death. It means that we are eternally separated from God because of our sin. Eternally separated. That means forever and ever 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 and ever. You are separated from God because you have sin. Jesus became on the cross for three hours from 12 until 3 in the afternoon. He became our sin. And God turned his back on his son, beloved son. And Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me, God? And it was because Jesus became our sin. Scripture says not only did he pay for our sin, he became our sin. And God had to turn his back on it because God cannot put himself in the presence of sin. Sin is evil. Sin is evil. Sin is of Satan. We're going to talk in depth about sin. Sin is, is evil, and God does not allow sin in his presence. Why? Because he is a holy God. He is perfect in every way. And he does not allow sin in his presence. So he turned his back on Christ. But you see, the scripture goes on to tell us, after Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then later on, scripture tells us that God will never leave us nor forsake us. He forsake Jesus on the cross, but he won't forsake us. Why? Because we have the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins. You see? So only by the blood of Jesus will God never forsake you. Otherwise, you're done for sook. If you don't have the blood of Jesus covering your sin, you're done for soup. You won't go to heaven. That's what Scripture says. That's what Scripture teaches us. And we believe what Scripture says. You have to believe in the Word of God. The Word of God is Jesus, John 1. It is Jesus. So we have to believe in Christ. We have to believe in Jesus. You can't take anything from this or add anything to this. Because if it is, then you're trying to improve or disapprove Jesus. No, no, that's not a good thing to do. Read uh, Revelation 22. All the curses of the book of Revelation will be cast upon you. If you add to or take from these words, Jesus says. So being separated from God is the sin, and it is a sin nature. Now get this, you're going to feel good about yourself again. The sin nature is what you are born with. What? Well, I don't want it. You don't get a choice. You are born with it. Ephesians 2 and 10 tells us that, or 5 and 10 tells us that we are born enemies of God. We're born enemies of God. Paul tells us that if you do not have God, if you don't have Christ, you cannot please God and you do not have God. So you have to have Christ. Sin keeps us from having Christ or God in our lives. Now, God, Jesus ascended and went back to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit to live in our lives. But even with the Holy Spirit coming back, if you have a, what we call a habitual sin, 
a habitual sin. Now, we all mess up, all right? And God knows that. And he knows you're going to mess up tomorrow. He knows you're going to mess up the next day, on and on and on and on and on. But if you habitually sin, if you, and we're going to get into this in just a minute, if you truly know that there's something in your life that God does not want you to, to correct, and you don't correct it, that's a, a habitual sin. And if you have a habitual sin, you better check to see if you are saved. Oh, well, I'm saved because I got dunked in the water. The water does nothing. Well, I'm saved because I go to a Christian church. There's lots of sinners in the church. Can I get a witness on that one? Okay. We're all sinners saved by grace. But there's some saved by grace. There's some not saved by grace. Only you and God know whether you're saved or maybe do you know if you are saved. That's really where we're going with this today. Do you really know if you're saved? Oh, but my dad was a preacher. <laughs> you ever heard of the, uh, the what do you call them, PC kids? Or uh, PKs? Preacher's kids? Probably some of the worst they ever lived, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Just because you're affiliated with a Christian family, if you will, does not mean you're a Christian. All right? It doesn't. Just because you go to a building and stand up and raise your hands and sing praises and make a prayer or say a prayer, this, that, and the other, does not make you a Christian. Oh, but I said, come, Lord Jesus, come. I said, Jesus, I believe in your name. I called on the name of Jesus, and that's what it says. Scripture says, if you call on the name of Jesus, you shall be saved. There's a little bit more to it than that. Now, see, what we try to do from the pulpit, it, whenever we have, a, in a sense, a new congregation, if you will, we have to use the, and I, this is no disrespect whatsoever, but we have to use the elementary scriptures to try to get people to think. Yeah. To get people to think. No disrespect to the younger generation, but the younger generation today, try to get them to make change for you. Okay? Because they haven't had to think because they, and I'm not being, trying to be disrespectful, but they haven't had to think because they have a computer to do it all. My grandkids, I say, well, how do you do your math? Oh, I get out my calculator. What? You get out your calculator to do math? Why don't you figure it out in your head? Why don't you work out the, oh, because it's easier to do the calculator. Sure, it's easier. But life would be easier too if everybody just took care of everything we needed, right? They don't do that. You got to take care of yourself. You got to learn. You got to learn. And that's why we do Bible study so much here. Because we need to learn the Bible. Not just hear the words. We need to learn the Bible. So when people say, oh yeah, well I called on the name of Jesus so I know I'm saved. No. No. That is not how you get saved. But that's what scripture says. But there's more to it than that. You have to go deeper into scripture. You can't take something on the service. Here's another one that a lot of people think. Oh, well, God uses everything for good. That's what the Bible says. Well, he doesn't use everything for good. Some things he uses for, uses for evil. Look at Judas Iscariot. Okay? Look at uh, a Pharaoh over with Moses. Sometimes God uses bad things to get good people to realize they need to be gooder. Right? Right? Sure he does. He does. He can use anything he wants to use to try to get your attention, to get you to start thinking about where you're at in your walk with him. And we need to do that daily. It's called self-examination. Sin is a sin nature. It is a nature that we are born with. We don't have a choice. And in this... In this, we are in a constant battle, a constant battle throughout our entire lives. Oh, you mean it's not going to quit whenever I say Jesus? No, it's not going to quit. Matter of fact, it's probably going to get a little worse because Satan is going, oh, no, I ain't losing that one. I'm going, I'm going to strike him down. I'm going to make him not go to church. I'm going to, I'm going to throw stuff in his path. I'm going to make him say, why, Lord, are you doing this after I confess Jesus is Lord and all this? And why have things gotten so much worse? Because Satan is trying to separate you from the love of Jesus, from the love of God. 
That's his job. That is his job. Why do you think he tried to tempt Jesus in the uh, wilderness three times? And how did Jesus fight him off? By the word. By the word of God. That's how you fight off the devil. By the word of God. We're born with this sin nature that has come to us and it remains in us. And it actually alienates us from God. Right off the bat, you're born as an enemy of God. Isn't that a horrible thing? Well, I don't want to be a, a, an enemy of God. Well, you can do something about it. But it also keeps us from knowing God. It keeps us from knowing God. It keeps us from truly accepting God. And it also can keep us from hearing God. From hearing God. Our sin separates us from God. It separates us from God. Sin is of Satan. And sin destroys. Sin destroys the life that God has planned for you and for me. Sin destroys the life God has planned for you and for me. Jeremiah 29, 11, you all know this. For I know the thoughts or plans. I know the thoughts that I think uh, about towards you, says the Lord. Thought of peace and not evil to give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plan that I have for your life. And it is to give you peace and a future and hope. So let's look back over at verse 5 in Ephesians 2. Even when you were dead in your trespasses, dead in your sins, he, God, made us alive together with Christ. Made us alive together with Christ. That means God has now transformed you from what you were to what he wants you to be. When you receive salvation. Oh, well, I, I'm sitting in church, so I guess God's just transforming me today, right? No. You have to receive Christ in order to be transformed. You do not have the Holy Spirit unless you have received Christ. You do not have God unless you receive Christ. You are not transformed. You're still the same old person sitting in a church. You're just the same old person. Oh, but I said, that don't work. Oh, but my dad was a preacher. That don't work. Oh, but I come here all the time. That don't work. Oh, but I gave so much money to the church, to the cause. You trying to buy your way into heaven? That certainly don't work. We have to understand only God changes us. It's a free gift. It's a free gift of God, not a free gift of, of um, I'm trying to think of somebody. I'm going to say a free gift of Johnny because I like to pick on Johnny. It's not a free gift that anybody can give you. It's not a Christmas gift. It's not a, a, a once a year, twice a year, three times a year thing. It's a one time. And it is a free gift of God from him he does the change he transforms you from that old enemy of God to a child of the most high God big change right you better believe it is he makes us alive not in heaven he makes us alive in Christ on this earth as we walk this earth we're able to be alive in Christ on this earth yeah, we're going to get to go to heaven when that time comes. But in the meantime, we are alive in Christ on this earth. We were dead, but now, according to the scriptures, we are alive with Christ. Remember last week when I went over all the scriptures that we were using and, and I kept leaving out that one little phrase, in Christ, in Christ, because everything evolves everything involves in Christ your 
total salvation, your total work with the Lord, uh, walk with the Lord, your, everything in, that you do from this point until eternity ends, and it don't end, depends on in Christ. In Christ. Well, that's just too much. I can't, I, I can't do all that. that. That's more than I can do. It's not more than you can do. It's not more than you can do. Remember Philippians 4 and 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Okay? You can do all things through Christ. Remember in Philippians 1, 6 where it says in God, what God has started in me, he will bring to completion. Yeah, you can. You can do it. But we have that defeated attitude. We have that, oh, it's just too hard. Oh, I got to get up and go to church again this Sunday. I, I went four Sundays in a row. What do they want? You don't come to church for, for us, though we are blessed by your presence, and we truly are. But you come to church to receive your blessing as well. And you come to church to be a blessing. What? Yeah. Yeah. We are blessed to have you here with us today worshiping our Lord. We are. Maybe not Johnny, but everybody else we are. I'm just picking on you, brother. You know I love you. Okay, okay, good. Making you think? Good. That's what I want to do. Make you think. All right. But Paul says that you are now a new creation. He says it over in, uh, if you don't go there, but if you want to uh, write it down, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... In Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is, not was, not will be, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's a transformation. That's getting rid of the old stuff and now being all the new that God had planned for you. Jeremiah 29, 11. He says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans for you to prosper. Plans for you to multiply. Plans for you to be a blessing. Plans for you to know that you have eternal life with God. Plans for you that things are going to be good. But things are hard. Yeah, why are you living in a fallen world and you got to fight that battle? You have to fight the battle, and it is a battle we don't like. Let's go over to Ephesians 4. Flip the page. Ephesians 4, starting at verse 17. Ephesians 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk. You see that? You should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. In other words, the rest of the unsaved, the rest of the unbelievers. You should, no, you should no longer walk as they walk. Why? Because you have been transformed. You are a new creation. You are something that never existed before. You have been saved. Walk like you appreciated it a little bit, please. It says, in the futility of their mind, in the futility of their mind, which simply means they don't even know that they're unsaved, and they certainly don't know that they're saved. If we are walking in our old ways, where's the transformation? Where's the recreation? Where's the regeneration of our souls, not our bodies? But where's the regeneration of our spirit? Where is it? Where's the evidence? We're still living the same old life. Oh, yeah, I got saved, so now I can just live like hell because I'm going to heaven. Don't count on it, friend. Don't count on it. Because if you live a habitual sinful life, there is no evidence of your salvation, and you probably are not saved. Now, I'm not passing judgment here because that's God's job. But as Scripture tells me, when we see someone not walking in the ways they should walk, they are probably not saved or they're ignorant. No, ignorant is not a bad word. Ignorant simply means a lack of knowledge, unknowing, okay? And we're going to see this right here in the scripture. Verse 18, 
having their, let's, let's read 17 again. This, there, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the, the rest of the Gentiles in their futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, their minds clouded, their minds cluttered, being alien, alienated from the life of God because of ignorance. There's the word. That is in them because of the blindness of their heart. We got a heart condition here. People say, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in this. Yeah, 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 there's church. You know, it's a good thing and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, I, I don't need church. I tried to share a couple of weeks back why we need to be in church. The, the ministry that we have, ministry that we have, ministry of the church that goes out over the air, the live stream, is for those who cannot come to church. It's for those who cannot come to church for whatever reason. Hebrews, I'm drawing a blank. Hebrew, I think it's 10, 25 or 10, 35. Hebrews 10 or 20, 35 or, or 25 says, Thou shall not forsake the assembling of yourselves. Go to church. That's what it's saying. Don't stay at home because you're too lazy to get up out of your, uh, can't go there. You can't get, can't get off your duff, Okay and put some decent clothes on and, and go to church. Oh, but it's raining. I might get wet. You'll only lump up. You're not going to melt. All right? Oh, well, it, it's cold outside. So what? Put a coat on. Don't, you, don't come up with excuses. Anybody, you know what excuses are? I can't go there, that's for sure. Okay? But excuses just make us look like fools because there is no excuse. There is now. If you're sick, I'm not talking about if you're sick. I'm not talking about if you don't have a ride. I'm not talking about if you don't have the money to put gas in your car. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if you're too cotton picking and lazy to get up off your duff and go to church. That's what I'm talking about. Shame on you. Shame on you. All right? I hope I shame somebody. We have a blindness or a hardening in our heart because we don't think it's necessary. Well, God doesn't need you. Understand that, please. But God sure does want you. He sure does want you. And whenever you sing his praises, especially in with your brothers and sisters in Christ, when you raise your hands, when you glorify in him, scripture tells us that those songs and hymns go up into his nostrils as a uh, fragrant smoke. And he just inhales your praises. And it pleases his heart. Would you not want to please his heart? I pray you do. I pray you do. Verse 19, who by, who being past feeling, that means you're thinking, all right? Past feelings mean the way you used to be, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanliness and greediness. Well, I took a shower yesterday. I'm not unclean. And some people might even think that. But that's not what he's talking about. I told you earlier, your sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus and only by the blood of Jesus. This is the uncleanliness, the sin in your life. Now, you may not be, have lewdness and you may not be a greedy type of person, but I guarantee you, you still have sin in your life. You may not be a mass murderer. You may not be robbing Fort Knox or whatever. You may not be stealing from old women and old men or whatever. But you still have sin in your life. We all have a degree of sin in our lives. All of us do. It doesn't mean that we're horrible, bad, wretched people. It just simply means that we got an issue, a sin issue. And we all have it. And so we need somebody to take care of it. We need somebody to help us with it. Over in John 3 and 7, we, we saw this a couple of weeks ago. It says, and I actually taught on this very 
very uh, scripture. It says, you must, Jesus says, you must be born again. You must be born again. What did it say over in Ephesians 2 uh, and 5? Made alive in Christ. That means you're born again in Christ because you didn't really suffer a physical death. Remember where it says that you are dead in your transgressions? When you're dead in your sins, you didn't literally die, but you died to God. Your spirit, man, your soul is dead to God. Literally dead to God because God cannot allow you into his presence because you are a sinful, unforgiven person. Except for the blood of Jesus. And you receive the blood of Jesus when you are born again. When you are born again. That's what Jesus says. He, he goes on to say in that same scripture, he says that you must be born of the, of the water and born of the spirit. What does that mean? Born of water means the washing of the word. The word over and over and over is considered as water. And that water and only that water, which is Jesus Christ, can wash away your sins. Then you are born of the spirit. The Spirit means the Holy Spirit coming and living in you. And may, Jesus says, this is the way Jesus put it over in John 16. He says, I have to go to heaven and I and the Father promise you this. I and the Father, you got Jesus and God in the form of the Holy Spirit. He says, I and the Father will come and make our dwelling in you and we will sup with you, which means that we will eat with you, we will sleep with you, we will dine with you, we will go out to the ball game with you, on and on and on. We are with you and we will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's God's promise to you. Only those who are saved, though. Only those who are saved. Well, by God, I want to be saved right now. I'm going to preach myself into salvation. <laughs> but seriously, if you look at the promises, okay, let me tell you this. It's not my notes, but this is in Scripture. Scripture tells us all the promises that God was to bestow on Jesus. He gave him the entire world and the entire universe. He gave him everything. He says, I put everything under your feet. Everything. All those promises are yours. They're yours. All of them. All that Jesus has is yours. Why? Because you are brothers and sisters of Christ. You're child, children of the Most High God. If you're saved. Salvation is important. You don't just take it for granted. Oh, yeah, well, I got, you know, I got saved in these other churches. You know, I got baptized in every one of them I went to. I think it was about 20 of them. I got dunked so many times, I still got wrinkles. It does nothing for you. Where is the, where's the baptism? We know this. It's in the heart. It's the renewing of your heart. The changing of your heart. That's where, your, that's where your soul gets everything it needs to live the life God has called you to live. It comes from your heart. So you have a heart condition and you need a heart change. You need a heart change. We're going to get there. I promise you. In Matthew 5, 10, on the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus tells us, he's talking about our sins. He says, if your right hand sins, chop it off. Please, don't no, nobody go home and chop their hand off. Okay? But he's, this is what he's trying to teach. If there is a sin in your life, a sin in your life, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Just a little sin. Because if you don't, the entire soul will suffer in hell. That's what he said. Matthew 5 and, or Matthew, is that what I said? Matthew 5, 5 and uh, 30. Matthew 5, 30. Chop it off. Get rid of whatever it is. Because one tiny little sin can keep you out of heaven. One sin. Oh, well, I only do, you know, not so bad sins. You know, I tell a little lie now and then. Still a cookie now and then. She tells me I can have them, so I get, I get them when she tells me. You know, I don't do anything. I, you know, I kind of 
kind of don't always tell everything that I need to tell. I don't kind of, you know, stretch the truth out a little bit. A sin is a sin is a sin is a sin. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. A sin is a sin. But you know what people's usual response is? It don't hurt nobody. It's just something that I do, and I like to do it. Well, now, I'm not trying to pick on your sin, and I, nor do I even care what your sin is, because you know what? That's between you and God. It is the Holy Spirit that is going to point out your sins, not me. I'm not your judge, nor do I want to be your judge, nor are you my judge. God is my judge. Paul says, I don't even judge myself. I leave it up to God to show me and direct me and judge me. Because I don't want to judge me. Because if I do, we're going to get into that in just a minute. But the usual response is, is that it's not a big deal. Well, I'm the only one that knows I do it anyway. So what the heck? God don't care. Do you realize that God is always with you? Okay, now think about this. He is always with you. You go take a shower, you think you're by yourself? You ain't. You go take care of business, you ain't by yourself. Okay? You do a little white lie now and then that nobody cares about, you ain't by yourself. You did a little something that uh, you shouldn't be doing. You ain't by yourself. Nobody sees me. No big deal. God sees you. He's with you. You ain't fooling him. You think God is sitting up there going, oh, oh God. You know, God saying, oh, God to himself, right? Oh, God. I can't believe Brett would do that. Just checking on you, buddy. I can't believe Ted would do that. I can probably believe Woody would do it, but I can't believe that Clark wouldn't do it, would do it. God ain't surprised. You don't shock him. You're not doing anything that he don't know about. Don't fool yourself. He's there. He's there. But if God puts something on your heart, now this is, we need to understand this. If God puts something on your heart that is hindering your walk with him, now, not something that I said, I'm not your judge. I may say, well, Brent, you don't need to do that. Okay, it's just me and Brent. We're buddies, okay? We're just talking back and forth. And maybe I know that he really shouldn't do whatever it is he's doing, and I'm just trying to help him with his walk. But if God says, Brent, stop doing it. It was funny. A couple of weeks ago, my sister-in-law was up in Washington State, or, or Oregon, Oregon, where her dad lives. And they have this security thing that if they're outside up there, there's a camera. And here, this amazes me because I'm a simple-minded person. I, Terry can talk to her while she's outside up there. Just like we're talking right now. And so she was out there doing some uh, decorations and stuff, getting rid of the Christmas stuff. And I don't usually talk to her. Very, very rarely do I do because you can't get a word in between them two. I didn't say that, did I? But anyway, Terry says, here. And I, and I went, Susan, this is God. And <laughs> And she went, <laughs> she, she told Terry, she said, he scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> we thought it was funny. And she thought it was funny afterward, but during she didn't think it was so funny. But my point is simply this. If you hear the voice of God and he is telling you to stop doing something, then stop doing it. 
Well, what if it's something that I just really like to do and I don't think it's bothering anybody, I don't think it's hurting anybody, and so it's just no big deal, right? James 4.17, don't go there, but you can write it down. James 4.17 tells us, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him who knows to do good, in other words, if God has told you to quit doing whatever, and you do not do it, it is sin to him. To him, it is a sin. You see, God may tell Johnny to do something, and he may tell me, in a sense, it's okay for now. Or he may say, Woody, you need to quit this, but he hasn't told Johnny that yet, and so Johnny hasn't quit whatever it is. Do you, you get my drift there? You see what I'm trying to say? Okay, God is not going to perfect me to perfection. Bam, I'm perfect. No, he's going to work on me for the rest of my life. And he's not going to perfect you to perfection. Bam, once you're saved in your body and soul, your spirit is made perfect, by the way, John, 1 John 3. Your spirit, is made, your spirit is made perfect just like Christ. Your spirit, the image of God that you were, that you were made into over in... Um, Genesis uh, uh, 226, I think it is, or 223. You were made in the image of God. God is a spirit. Your spirit, man, is made, your inner man is made perfect, absolutely perfect. But you still got a soul and a body to deal with. And if God is telling that spirit, man, hey, get a hold of your soul and get this changed in the body, and you don't do it, then it is a sin to you. That's what the scripture says. It is a sin, and that separates you or hinders your walk with Christ. Paul speaks, it, speaks of it in another way, to help us see that we all have, we all have this battle that we battle. Every one of us do. Different sins for different people, that battle with the old self year after year and don't seem to be winning the battle. You ever been down that road? Yeah. There's been things in my life that God says, quit, 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 quit. And he's still saying, quit, 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 quit. It's that hard-heartedness I have. Okay? I have to kind of retract that because I don't want to be, I don't want to feel as though I'm lying. And I'm not trying to boast in any way. But I think I've pretty much gotten rid of, other than maybe uh, food addictions, I think I've pretty much, you know, cleaned up my act, if you will. I mean, I still do things that don't, are displeasing to God, like eat too much, but I love food. But the thing is, is that I try to please God by correcting the things in my life. I wholeheartedly want God to look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Good job, Woody. Keep going. Keep trying. Keep struggling. Don't stop. Because you're going to fight this battle forever and ever and ever until you go to heaven. You don't think so? Look over. You know who Paul is, right? His name was Saul. He was converted on the road to Damascus to Paul. He wrote almost uh, over half of the New Testament. He's, he wrote the book in Ephesians that we're reading about right now. Look over in Romans 3. I mean Romans 7, sorry. Romans 7. Now, I'm not going to confuse you with this, and I'll explain it real quick because there's a simple explanation of it, but you may get a little lost as I read through it. Romans 7, starting at verse 14, 7, 14 through 25. I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we'll go back briefly and talk about it. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. Dun. There you are right there. We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal. That means I'm a human being. All right? Sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will, will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree that the law, that the law is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Remember that sin nature you're born with? You have sin living in your life. You have sin living in your soul. 
that sin uh, that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, in my flesh, which is your soul and your body, nothing good dwells. For it, it, it for to will is present, for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. In other words, he's sitting there trying to say, I can't do what I know I need to do. I have this sin nature that lives within me that I have to battle on a constant basis. Verse 19, for the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice, that I do. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. You see the battle you have? You have a sin battle living in you that you have to battle. It's not just, you know, um, oh, well, I'll just overcome. No, you got to fight it. You got to fight it. Verse 21, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. I want to do good, but the sin that lives in me keeps making me do the things I don't want to do. For I delight in the law of God according to the inner, inward man. According to the inward man. This is your spirit man. This is the true person you are, a spirit being. And that is made perfect, 1 John 3. But I see another law in my members, your soul and your body, warning against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man, I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Who will deliver me from this body of death? There's only one. I thank God through Christ, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, with the mind of with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. In other words, right there, he is saying, I know I have to battle this battle. I will serve the law of God, which is to trust God, which is to believe in God, which is to put my wholehearted uh, uh, efforts into the, the way God wants me to live. But I know there's still a law of sin in me, and I have to fight the battle. But look at 8 1, 8 1 and 2. There is therefore no condemnation, not conviction now, but no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You see that? You are, who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. 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 That's what salvation does. That's what salvation does. It makes you free. Free. Jesus says, who I, the son sets free, you are free indeed. So it sets you free of the death that sin comes with only by living in Christ Jesus. No other way. Only in Christ Jesus. This is how important it is. Oh, but I go to church. I just don't believe all that stuff. Well, I'm not your judge, but you know what? Most likely you ain't saved. Okay? Because you have to believe in the works of Christ. You have to believe in the works of Christ. In Christ Jesus. So important that we always include that. And this is not an excuse to continue being the old self, believing, oh yeah, I'm saved. I called his name. I got dunked in the water of the real church. We have a religion that believes that. They're the real church. And the water that is in their baptismal is the real water. The water has nothing to do with it. If you go to the day of Pentecost, 
over in chapter 2 and 3 of the uh, book of Acts, there is no mention of water in the upper room. None, okay? They were baptized later on. And they were added to day to day to day to day. But that night that 120 were added, there was no baptism there, not in the water. There was certainly baptism in the Holy Spirit, amen. You better believe it. That Holy Spirit came down and went, bam, I got y'all. He does the same thing to us. He comes down and lives in us, in us. But remember James 14, if it is sin to you and you don't correct it, it is a sin. It is a sin. First, we need to see what happens when you are saved. And guess what? It's not something that you do. Let's go to our scriptures. Finally, he says. But let's go and see what God does. Let's see what God does when you are saved. Not what you do. But we're going to see what God does when you are saved. Ezekiel 36, starting at verse 24. Ezekiel 36, verse 24. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because it's self-explanatory. But what I want you to see is the for I, then I, I will, etc. I want you to see that because this is God speaking, all right? This is not uh, Ezekiel speaking. This is not the man speaking. This is God speaking. Verse 24, for I will take you, sinner, from among the nations, which means from among the people, not nations as in countries and such, but from among the people, I will take you by yourself, Gather you out of all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will bring you into your own land, which means the kingdom of God that is planned for you. I will bring you into my kingdom. It's his kingdom, not ours. But he will bring each and every one of us to himself, is what it is saying. To himself. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. That is saving uh, the, the water of uh, of, uh, of the blood of Christ being sprinkled over you and washing you away, uh, washing away your sins. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new, look at this. I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new heart. Where does all of our desires to be with the Lord and please the Lord comes from? It doesn't come from our brain. It comes from our heart. So God is going to take, he's not going to fix the existing heart. He's not going to add to the existing heart. He's not going to get a hammer and nail and nail it all back together or super glue it together. That's not what he's going to do. He's going to take it out. He's going to eliminate that old heart. It says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will take that heart of stone out of your flesh and I will give you a new heart of flesh. Simply saying, he's going to take that old hard-hearted heart. Well, I don't really believe all that stuff. That heart is going to be gone. It's going to be gone. And he's going to take a new heart, a heart created for God's purpose, a heart made of flesh, a real heart. So it's not something just spiritual in you saying, oh, well, you need to be a, a, a child of God. You need to be religious. You need to be righteous. No, he's going to take your heart and he's going to change that heart, that hard-hearted heart that you live with and, and make a new heart, put a new heart, not repair that one, not change that one, get rid of that one, put a brand new heart in you that has the desires to live for God. That's what he's going to do. That's what he does. He changes that rotten, stinking, sinful heart that you have and gives you a brand new heart, a heart for the Lord. A heart for the Lord. He says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. In other words, you will start obeying the Lord. You're not going to live for yourself. You're going to start living for him. Then you shall dwell in the land that I have given your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. 
I will deliver you from the uncleanliness. I, I will, I will, I will, I will. This is God doing all this stuff, not us. I will call for the grain to multiply and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. He will supply all your needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 19, right? Everything you need, not everything you want, everything you need, he's going to supply it. I will multiply the fruit of your trees and increase your fields so that you need never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations, among the people. In other words, he's going to take care of you. You ain't got to worry about it. God's got it. Then you will remember your evil ways. Uh-oh. We got to remember, not to remember how bad we were, but to see how far we've come. You see the difference there? We all know our righteousness is like filthy rags and our sins are even more dirtier. They're even worse. Man, I'm so glad that he touched my life. I, that's all I can tell you right now. It just, it blows my mind, but he did. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. That were not good. And you will loathe yourself, which means not humble yourself. You will think very, very lowly of yourself. But you shouldn't. Because you don't look back and see how bad you were. You look back to see how far you've come. You will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Wow, I look back at the things that I've done in my life. I've told y'all many times and I still believe it today. I don't know why God would save me. I mean, I, I just, never would I have saved me. Thank God he did. Not for your sake do I do this. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, it ain't about me anymore, is it? It never has been. It never has been. Not for your sake do I do this, says the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded of your own ways, O house of Israel, which means all those who are under God. All right? All those who believe. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities and bring your <coughs> bring, wait a minute, and, and, and the ruins shall be rebuilt. In other words, he's going to take your old life, and everybody remembers my old life, and they cannot believe the new life, but that's exactly what he's going to do. He's going to get rid of the old life, and he's going to give me a new life, and people are going to go, what? You got to be kidding me. You're not dead and in hell already? You're preaching at a church? Are you kidding me? You've led Bible study for 18 years every Wednesday night, except for when Thanksgiving is here in November. For 18 years, you've been teaching the Bible? What? No way. But you see, that's what God can do. If he can do it for me, he can do it for you. Not only that, he will. He will do it for you. The desolate land shall be tilled instead and lying desolate in the sight of all who pass it. So they will say, this land that was desolate has become like a garden of Eden. And the wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. In other words, God is going to build you up. Up, up, up to where people are going, what? No way. Yeah. Why? Because they see the new you. You're transformed. You're a new creation. Remember 2 Corinthians 5 and 15, or 15 and 5 and 17. I'll get it in a minute. You're a new creation. You're something that didn't exist before. So what they saw before, that no longer exists. The old man is gone. The old man is dead. The new man, new woman, 
is now alive in Christ. <coughs> the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted, it, and planted what it was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Man, there's a promise right there, friend. Thus says the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel inquire to me to do this for them. I will, in other words, he's going to save some Jews. I will increase their men like a flock, like a flock offered as holy sacrifices, that like the flock of Jerusalem on its feast days, so shall the ruined cities be filled with flocks of men. God is going to save on and on and on. He's going to save uh, Terry. He's going to save William. He's going to save uh, uh, Carolyn. He's going to save, I'm, I'm losing names here, Clark. He's going to save Melissa. He's going to save, I don't mean to exclude everybody else. He's going to save Brenda. He's going to save Johnny. He's going to save Ted. He's going to save uh, um, Beverly. Thank you. I mean, he's, going to save, he's going to save all that will come to him. Oh, he's not just going to be a few people. Do you realize there's going to be more Gentiles, saved Gentiles in heaven than there will be Jews? We saw that in Romans this last week when we were studying it. There'll be more, it's over in Isaiah, there will be more Gentiles, that's you and me, converted people in heaven than there will be the Jewish people, God's chosen people. There will be a remnant, but there'll be more of us. Don't you want to be a part of us? And I don't mean part of me, I mean a part of Christ and a part of his church. Verse 38, like a flock offered as holy sacrifices, like a flock at Jerusalem on its feast day, so shall the ruined cities be filled with flocks of men. Why? Then they shall know I am the Lord. Wow. You see, it ain't for you that God saved you. It's for him. It's for him. It's for his glory. Because see, when people look at me and they remember the old me and then they look at me now and they go, but God. That's what they do. But God. And if God can save this one, he can certainly save you. So why does he save us? Go back to Ephesians 2.10. Remember where we were at earlier? I said, keep that, and we didn't do the last verse. Ephesians 2.10, it says, for we, okay, now I want you to really, really see this scripture. We are his workmanship. Now, what does it mean whenever Paul is saying we are his workmanship? It means like a Rembrandt or a Michelangelo. We are his masterpiece. We are his masterpiece that he has created. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Not you will, not we will. He will. And he will create his work. He takes his hands and he forms you just like he formed you in your mom's womb. He takes his hands and he forms that new creation that you are. And he makes his masterpiece. How special are you? God takes everything in his power, everything in his power, and he got a lot of power, okay? But he takes everything in his power to create you for his glory. Not for your glory, not so that you can show off to somebody else, not so somebody else can go, <gasps> not so that anybody can be amazed. You're created for his glory. That's why you're created. To do the works. To do the works. You don't do the works to get saved. You get saved because you're created to do the works. Verse 10. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, before anything. Remember Jeremiah 29, 11? I know the plan that I have for you. 
prepared beforehand that you should walk in them, not walking in sin, not walking in unrighteousness, not walking in whatever it is God is telling you to get rid of, but walking in the steps of Jesus, walking in the shadows of Jesus, emulating, imitating Christ as much as you possibly can, though you have to fight a battle every day, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. That is what you're supposed to be doing. Each day being made more and more and more in the image of his son, Jesus. That's what we're called to do, folks. That's what we're called to do. Now you can say, I don't want that. That's too hard, too much work. I just don't care to do it. Friend, only you and God know if you're saved. We see first God will create that new you by giving you the heart that new heart that longs, that desires, that reaches to praise him and love him instead of ourselves. He will rebuild your life that Satan has tried to destroy. He will prosper you in ways that he wants to prosper you. And the world shall behold the most powerful, powerful works of the Lord, creating a new you. And the world will give God all the praise and the glory. Amen. Amen. He will. For what he can and will do for another, he can and will do for you. If you allow him to. God will not only make, he will not ever make you love him, but he will do everything he possibly can to show you the love he has for you so that you will make a choice. Make a choice because you have the choice. You will make a choice to love him. It's all he wants. If you will just love him, truly love him, then he will take it from there. He says, I will get rid of that old hardened heart that you have. And I will put in a new heart of flesh. One that desires him. Because that's, that's our purpose. Is to love him. Why? Because he first loved us. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, if there's anyone here today who does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior, Father, I ask you, I pray, Lord, that you will soften that heart. It's a heart of stone. That's what, that's what your word says. We have a heart of stone. We war against God. We are enemies of God. And if there's anybody here today who does not have Christ as Lord and Savior of their life, then they have that hardened heart, whether they believe it or accept it or, or even, uh, even want to believe it or not. It doesn't matter. If you have not accept, I think, and it's, and it's not my message, please, it's God's message, but I think if, if you have not received Jesus Christ after today's message, uh, your heart is so hard, I, I don't know that it can be broken other than by God. But if you have not received Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that you will make that change today. You will allow God to remove that hardened heart and to put in the heart he wants you to have. Still a heart of flesh, but a heart that desires him. If that's you today and you truly in your heart desire to be a child of the Most High God, you do simply call on his name. But as you have seen, there's so much more to it than just calling his name. You call on his name and you ask him to come into your heart to be your Lord and your Savior. And he is a faithful God and he will do it. So if that's you today, pray this prayer, but mean it in your heart. Dear Jesus, I see that my heart has been hardened over the years. 
I see that I have a heart condition. And that heart needs to be changed out, not repaired, not added to. I need a transplant, Lord. I need a heart transplant. I want that new heart, that heart that lives for you. Take the old heart of stone out of my heart, out of my body, and put in that new heart of stone, uh, that new heart of flesh that your word says you will do. Father, I trust you in all things, especially to give me the gift of salvation so that I may live for you on this earth knowing that I am saved and knowing that I will spend eternity with you. God, and direct me from this point on for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, 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 amen. All right, let's all stand for our invitational song. If anybody needs prayer, I know some of you need prayer, and we will come to you, so just stay where you're at. But if anybody else needs prayer, you go ahead and come forward. Let us pray for you.